Okay, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for being with us today. And uh, we have a really uh, important uh, uh, presentation as well as a great presenter for it. Uh, before we do that, as usual, we will start off with our uh, weekly updates to Dr. Pinsky. Good morning, and thank you for having me on again. I'm tracking the variants of SARS-CoV-2 in the Clinical Virology Laboratory um, for this week. Uh, what's new is that the double mutant originally identified in India now has a official pangolin lineage name, B1617 or 1617. We have now confirmed six of those cases by whole genome sequencing. I believe these were the first um, identified in the United States. Um, and there are now 10 presumptive uh, cases based on RT-PCR screening, and we're working on sequencing those for confirmation. Um, in addition, uh, we've seen a number of additional uh, P1 variants uh, originally identified from Brazil. Uh, three have been confirmed by whole genome sequencing, and there are additional seven presumptive cases that await confirmation. Uh, as Brian mentioned, uh, most of the variants that we're seeing are now the B117 or UK variant uh, that contains this mutation N501Y, um, as well as the California variant, uh, which contains this mutation L452R. And I'll show that on the, on the next slide. Uh, and, and just to emphasize, these mu mutations, the, these variants, though we are monitoring them and see them in our population, they account for a very small percentage of those individuals that are positive for SARS-CoV-2. So here's our epidemiologic curve looking at uh, L52R as a marker for the California variant, uh, uh, 427, 429. And then in blue, N501Y, which is the marker for the UK variant, N501Y alone. And you can see uh, over the last, uh, how many weeks is that? Nine weeks. Um, we've seen a decrease in the number of cases that we've uh, genotyped, although there is a little bit of a bump here that cor correlates with a slightly increased positivity rate, although um, uh, don't get qu concerned quite yet. We are monitoring and we'll see what happens there. Um, but what you can see that's really interesting is that the UK variant B117 has now overtaken, particularly over the last two weeks, um, the uh, California variant in our population. So we saw the crossover um, occur in samples collected last, last week. So now the UK variant is more common in our population uh, than the California variant, which is consistent with the rest of the country and also consistent with the transmissibility of this particular uh, variant, which appears to be higher than uh, the other variants of concern. Um, what we don't know yet is uh, these, whether this variant is associated with increased severity. There has been mixed reports on that. Uh, several reports coming out uh, this, this week uh, demonstrating the thought that there is less, uh, less uh, severe disease or not increased severity with the UK variant. Um, the vaccine uh, efficacy uh, data is relatively is consistent and demonstrates that uh, B117 is susceptible to uh, all vaccines. All right, so that's my report for uh, this week. Happy to take any questions in the chat. Thank you. As always, again, thank you so much, Dr. Pinsky. I want to turn over now to Dr. Harrington, who will uh, help us update on some exciting new news. Yeah, so thanks, Errol. And uh, again, thanks to all our panelists for joining us once again. And thank you to our guest who is, uh, is, is going to share his uh, insights and knowledge with us. Um, one of the things that, uh, that really we have the privilege to get to announce every year is our new chief residence. And uh, I just want to reflect before I turn it over to Ron and point out that in a Department of Medicine, one of the most important leadership roles are the medicine chief residents. And it's important in many ways because it serves as that interface between the faculty and the trainee, the trainees. And so it becomes a very visible uh, leadership role throughout the healthcare system, throughout the school. And we have certainly had fantastic chief residents over the years. 
uh, many of whom uh, go on to train here and, uh, and join the faculty. And so it's, a, uh, it's typically a great group of individuals, uh, talented clinicians, talented scientists, and, uh, and really talented educators and, and, uh, and early career leaders. So let me turn it over to our program director, Dr. Ron Watalis, to introduce, to, to remind us of our uh, chief residents who will be beginning in July uh, and guiding the program and then uh, our new chief residents who were just selected over the course of the last couple of weeks. So, Ron? Great, thanks so much, Bob. So uh, each year we're faced with a really tremendous challenge in choosing chief residents from among so many superb candidates, and this year was certainly no exception. Uh, we intentionally actually keep the number of chief residents in our program small, uh, smaller than most of our peer programs, and year in and year out, we do have a group of absolute stars. Before I announce the newly named 2022-2023 chief residents, I want to start by acknowledging the incredible work of this year's chief uh, residents, uh, Adrian Castillo, Mita Hoppenfeld, and Andrew Moore, who have really expertly led the program in a year that we can all safely say was like no other. And I also want to remind everyone of the incredible group of soon-to-be rising chief residents who will lead our program next academic year. And you see them on your screen there, Jessica Busing, Achieve Patil, Zach Gray and Gabriella Spencer Bonilla, uh, and they will be starting in June, and we are really excited to work with the four of them. Uh, but now I want to share with you the news, the exciting news of our newly named 2022-2023 chief residents, and tell you just a little bit about each of the four of them. So Peter Conan uh, graduated from UC Davis with a BS in pharmaceutical chemistry as part of the university honors program and then enrolled at UCLA for medical school where he graduated at the top of his class, including earning induction into both AOA and the Gold Humanism Honor Society. And while in medical school, Peter developed an interest in GI and hepatology, work that he's continued at Stanford with doctors AJ Ahmed and Robert Wong, and he already has eight peer reviewed publications in the space. Uh, he's been a leader in his class, recognized for his clinical performance as a winner of the peer-nominated Julian Wolfson Award for Outstanding Performance in Internal Medicine in 2019, and as a member from the Met, uh, as a winner of, from the medical school of the Arnold P. Gold Humanism and Excellence in Teaching Award in 2020. And after his chief resident year, Peter plans to pursue fellowship in GI hepatology and ultimately a career in transplant hepatology. And Errol, if you don't mind advancing the slide so we can see the next group. Thanks. Christine Santiago graduated from Cornell University with a BA in human biology prior to enrolling in medical school at Harvard. Uh, she graduated cum laude from Harvard Medical School in 2019 and earned an MPH from UC Berkeley the year before. During this time, she developed a particular focus and interest in diversity and, and underserved communities, serving as co-chair of the HMS Women of Color in Medicine and Dentistry Organization, of being recognized as a Kaiser Permanente Public Health Fellow, and being awarded both the McKinsey APD Diversity Impact Award and the Harvard Presidential Scholars Public Service Initiative Award. At Stanford, she further developed these interests, showing true talent in program development as a founder and leader of a new residency program curriculum called Stanford HEARS, which stands for Stanford Health Equity Advocacy and Research, and is an active member of the Women in Medicine Mentorship Program. After her chief resident year, Christine plans to pursue a career in either cardiology or hospital medicine. Elena Vasti graduated from UC Davis with a BS in human development and exercise physiology, and then earned an MPH from UCLA. During that time, she also worked as a public health and grant coordinator for the UCLA Mobile Clinic Project. And she then spent two more years as a researcher and program uh, manager at UCLA, studying the integration of the findings of the diabetes prevention programs into primary care practices. She subsequently enrolled at UCSF for medical school where she continued her interest in clinical research, uh, implementing a pilot health study assessing self-monitoring behavior and optimization of blood pressure for patients in medically underserved areas. After an outstanding performance at medical school, we were thrilled when she joined Stanford for residency, and she's been a real leader and star from day one. She uh, was a winner of the peer-nominated Julian Wolfson Award uh, as an intern, uh, and she's been an elected class representative for each of her years as a resident. And she's pursued research with doctors Paul Wong, Fatima Rodriguez, and Alex Sandu in cardiology. Lane is universally recognized for her professionalism, positivity, and teamwork, and after her chief resident year, Elena plans a career in cardiology. And finally, Sarah Waliani graduated from USC, magna cum laude with a BS in biological sciences and was awarded the presidential scholarship from USC for all four years of her undergraduate education. And she then came to Stanford where she earned both her MD as well as an MS in epidemiology and clinical research. 
She was a superb medical student, was inducted into the Gold Humanism Honor Society, and she demonstrated really a superb research productivity while working in the growing field of cardio-oncology uh, with a large team, including Joel, Dr. Joel Neal, Sandy Srinivas, Jason Gottlieb, Sid Jaiswal, Hanju, and myself. And she's been an outstanding clinical resident while simultaneously continuing her really extraordinary research productivity during residency. She is a recipient of Stanford's TRAM grants. She's authored 14 total peer reviewed publications. And during residency alone, she's published two first author manuscripts in Jack Cardio Oncology. After her chief resident year, Sarah plans to pursue fellowship in oncology and ultimately plans a career in thoracic oncology. Um, as Dr. Harrington said, the chief residents play a vital role for the residency program and for the department, and we uh, really couldn't be more excited to have the opportunity to work with such an incredibly talented group. And then as a last reminder, I want to remind everybody that we have our annual resident research symposium this evening at 5.30 p.m. It's uh, a really fun and inspiring uh, event every year, and it gives you a chance to see the work and uh, to support our residents. And as it's 100% virtual for the second straight year, it's easy to attend. Uh, the login information by Zoom was included in yesterday's Department of Medicine weekly updates, and please reach out to me if you have any questions. So thanks for the time, and I hope you'll all join me in congratulating and giving a virtual round of applause uh, to the 2022-2023 Chief Residents, Peter, Christine, Elena, and Sarah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Wattel. As usual, that's a pretty amazing group of uh, Chief Residents, and congratulations to all the, the current and future Chief Residents. Uh, next, I'd like to uh, briefly uh, just mention, next week we have Dr. Julie Parson, who's going to talk to us more about uh, COVID-19 and herd immunity, followed by Dr. Eric Goosby, who's a member of uh, President Biden's uh, coronavirus task force, talking to us about uh, global health, following about uh, following with Dr. Um, Lata Palapanian. Uh, uh, it's going to talk to us about Asian health, uh, to founder health. So uh, thanks so much for everybody. Uh, I'd like to next turn over uh, the introduction to Dr. Patricia Wynn. Dr. Patricia Wynn is assistant professor of medicine, cardiovascular medicine at the Palo VA, and among other things, she's a member of our inclusion and diversity committee. It was Dr. Wynn who had the amazing idea to invite Dr. Lutz, that, who's presenting today, when she came upon, upon Dr. Lutz's amazing uh, um, email that talking about the uh, violence that's been spreading recently. So Dr. Wynn, thanks so much for being here and uh, introducing. Thank you, Errol. And, uh... I have the honor of introducing Dr. Liu. So Dr. Michael Liu was born in Taiwan and he grew up in the Bay Area and is a diehard San Francisco Giants fan. He graduated actually from Stanford University with a Bachelor's of Arts in Political Science and Human Biology. He then pursued advanced degrees in public policy, epidemiology, and health and medical sciences at Harvard and UC Berkeley. From there, he attended UCSF Medical School and completed his training in OBGYN at UC Irvine. In 1998, Dr. Liu joined the faculty at UCLA and he rose quickly in the ranks to become a professor in the Department of OBGYN and the Department of Community Health Services. At UCLA, Dr. Liu brought in more than $50 million in research and training grants. He's well known for his research on racial ethnic disparities in birth outcomes from a life course perspective. In 2017, he took a leave of absence from UCLA to direct the Federal Maternal and Child Health Bureau in the Obama administration. He managed a budget of more than $1.2 billion and a portfolio of 100 federal programs. He made a significant impact on reducing maternal and fetal mortality in the US. For his service, he was awarded the Herbert Hoover Humphrey Award for Service to America. In 2019, Dr. Liu became the Dean of the UC Berkeley School of Public Health. Today, we are fortunate that he's returning to his alma mater to share his perspective on the invisibility of anti-Asian American racism. Dr. Liu, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Patricia. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes. And I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. All right, well, good, good morning, everyone. They, uh, it's such a great honor to be invited uh, to speak at Stanford Medicine Grand Rounds, and thank you for this opportunity to talk to you uh, about anti-Asian American racism. Although, let me just say this up front, that, that I am certainly,
Hey, Patricia, my slides are not advancing. Oh, Errol, can you assist with that? Uh, you might need to hover over, I don't know if you have two screens, uh, hover over this shared screen to advance it. Hmm. Sorry about this, everyone. No problem. Um, I'm going to stop share and then try again. This is like the equivalent of the on and off switch. Nope, <laughs> that still didn't work. Era, what, what was your suggestion? So do you want to, maybe if you can talk a little bit and then can you share it? Sorry, we don't have a backup. We, um, you can share it over to me and I can try to advance them for you. One second, it's a fairly sizable uh, document. Hmm. Do you have one screen or? Oh, there we go. I just have one screen. I, I, I'm, I'm sorry about this. Oh, no worries. I think it's probably at some technical difficulties. We can't control. <laughs> Thank you so much. Sure, and uh, I, I was gonna say that, that I have to say this upfront that I, I'm really not much of a spokesperson on the topic, uh, that I've uh, never really been all that outspoken about racism uh, and, um, and never really fought on the front line for racial justice for Asian uh, AAPI communities and never even taken an Asian American history class. But the reason I got invited here uh, is because of an email that I wrote uh, to my own school of public health community that has gone viral. And it seemed to have struck a chord with a lot of folks. But I have to admit that I almost didn't finish the email. That several times I started the email the, the last couple months and I had to stop because the pain just got too personal. So I started writing this email in early February after the fatal assault of Vishar Ratanapati, the 84-year-old immigrant from Thailand who was violently shoved to the ground while on his morning walk in the neighborhood. Now, I'm going to play the video just to show you how vicious and senseless the attack was. As a warning, this may be hard to watch for some of you. Vishar never regained consciousness after the fall, he died three days later at San Francisco General Hospital. Again, I tried to start writing the email again after the murder of Angela Quinto by the police came to light in late February. Now, Angelo was a Navy veteran, 30 years old. Back on December 26, concerned family members had called the police because he was having some mental health problems. But instead of helping, one officer handcuffed Angelo while another pinned him down with a knee on his neck for at least five minutes. All the while Angelo was pleading, please don't kill me, please don't kill me. But the officer never took his knee off Angelo until he became lifeless and Angelo died three days later in the hospital. What has been really troubling to me about this case was that despite similarity to the murder of George Floyd, there really has been hardly any media coverage and very little outcry for justice for Angela. And then again, I tried to start writing the email uh, again in early March after the spate of anti-Asian violence right here in the Bay Area, right, right in our own backyard. I'm gonna show you a couple more videos. And again, a warning, the, these senseless acts of violence are truly heartbreaking to watch. A 91-year-old man in Oakland, Chinatown, who was violently shoved to the ground. And a 75-year-old woman in San Francisco who was punched in the head out of the blue.
And I, I don't know if you noticed this, but I just want to point out that while the paramedics were attending to the attacker on the gurney, the, the, the victim was actually left standing on her own to care for herself. It's almost as if she was invisible. Now, nationally, there, there has been a surge in anti-Asian violence with close to 3,800 anti-Asian racist incidents reported to stop AAPI hate since the start of the pandemic. But each time I started writing the email, I thought because I, I, I just, uh, before I could finish, not, not, not because I don't know what to say, I know it only too well. As a dean, one of my jobs, okay, whenever there has been a national tragedy, a mass shooting, a horrific act of violence, is to be the chief consoler to my community, to offer my support and condolences, to express our shared grief, to make sense of the senseless. I did it after George Floyd. I did it after the Capitol riot. But I just couldn't do it this time. In fact, my assistant dean of students kept telling me, you've got to say something. The students are expecting you to say something. I just told her that, that I tried, but I can't. And I can't really because the pain was getting too personal. It took me into some dark places, some dark recesses of my psyche that I hadn't visited in ages. It brought out all these memories, memories of all the insults and indignities that I have accumulated and repressed all these years, including the story that I share in the email, which I've actually never talked about in public before, never told my parents, never actually even shared with my wife. It took me back to my first experience of racism at age 11. A few months after my family immigrated to Conquer in the East Bay from Taiwan, and one day I was riding my bike in the neighborhood and was stopped by a little white girl shouting something. Now she couldn't have been more than six years old. So I stopped the bike to hear what she was saying. And even though I could barely understand English at the time, I could tell that she was shouting racial slurs and making a slanted eyes gesture and telling me to go back to where I came from. Now years later, I would often wonder what could have filled her heart with so much prejudice, so much hate at such a young age? And what made her feel so privileged on the basis of race that entitled her to put down a stranger twice her age and size? But at the time, I didn't know what to say or do. So I just left, rode away on my bike. I didn't even tell my parents because I didn't want to worry them. I just put it in a box seal it, and then store it away somewhere in some compartment back in the deep, deep, deep in my mind. Frankly, all I wanted to do was to fit in, to belong. And I thought that if I just kept my head down and worked hard, one day I would prove my worth and earn my rightful place in this country. And like many of my AAPI friends, that's how I've learned to deal with racism most of my life. But then on March 17th, the Atlanta shooting happened where eight people were gunned down, include, including six Asian women. And that was the day I said, enough is enough. It was a wake up call for me. I was wrong for not having spoken out earlier. And by not speaking out more, I've contributed to the invisibility of anti-Asian American racism. It's not taught in most textbooks. It's not much talked about in the media. And despite the surge of anti-Asian violence since the pandemic started, and despite all of these horrific crimes caught on tape, until Atlanta, there have been few mass protests, no call for justice, no national reckoning. It's as if as a, as we as a people are invisible, that anti-Asian American racism doesn't exist. That anti-Asian American racism is real. It's been a stain on this nation's history more than 150 years, even if we don't always see it. It was there in 1882 with the enactment of the Chinese Exclusion Act, the first major federal legislation to explicitly suspend immigration for a specific nationality. So beginning in the 1950s, more than 100,000 young men were recruited from Southern China to come to the United States for cheap labor. They worked as miners and farmers and factory workers and fishermen. They took work that nobody else wanted 
They reclaimed swampland in the Sacramento Delta. They asked their lives, they, they risked their lives to help build a transcontinental railroad. Then came the economic downturn in the 1870s, which stirred up a whole lot of racism and xenophobia that demonized Chinese immigrants as the yellow peril. Amidst natives' outcry that the Chinese are taking their jobs, waves of anti-Chinese violence and legislation swept across the US. There was the 1871 Chinese massacre, the worst lynching in US history, when a mob of 500 white men stormed the Los Angeles Chinatown, where they murdered and lynched 19 Chinese immigrants, including a 14-year-old boy and a doctor. And there was the passage of the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1882, promoted locally by attorney named John Henry Bolt. Now, if that name sounds familiar to you, it's because the law school at Berkeley was actually named after him for more than 100 years, and it wasn't until recently that his anti-Chinese racist writings were discovered that Berkeley decided to rename his law school. The exclusion of Chinese immigrants ushered in immigrants from other Asian countries because of the demand for cheap labor. But soon they too faced similar discriminations and exclusions. The Japanese in 1907, the Indians in 1917. Then in 2024, in 1924, these laws were consolidated under the Immigration Act of 1924, which fully excluded all Asian immigrants, including Chinese, Japanese, Koreans, Indians, denied them citizenship and naturalization, and prevented from marrying Caucasians or only land. Asian immigrants would not be granted naturalization rights until 1952, 70 years after the Chinese Exclusion Act. Anti-Asian racism was alive and well in 1942 when 100,000 Japanese Americans were sent to internment camps. All the while, brave Japanese American men in uniform fought against Germany and Japan to defend our freedom and some Japanese American women worked as Rosie the Riveter at the Kaiser shipyard in Richmond. They too were rounded up and sent to the internment camps. How many of you have heard of Vincent Chen? In 1982, Vincent Chen, a Chinese American engineer in Detroit, about to get married in a month, was out celebrating his bachelor's party with friends when he got into a scuffle with two white auto workers who mistook him as Japanese and blamed him for the loss of their jobs. The two men bludgeoned Vincent with a baseball bat until his head cracked open. Vincent was 27. Now, despite confessing to their crimes, the two men never served time in prison. And how many of you ever heard of Balbir Singh Saudi? On September 15, 2001, four days after 9-11, Babir became the first victim of post 9 11 hate crime. An immigrant of Sikh faith from India and a gas station owner in Arizona, Babir was shot five times by a gunman who mistook him for a Muslim because of the turban that he wore. The gunman had told his friends earlier that day that he was going to go out and shoot some towel heads. Babir was 52. In times of crises, Anti-Asian scapegoating has become an American tradition. We saw it after 9-11 with the surge of hate crimes against many of our South Asian American communities of Muslim, Hindu, and Sikh faith. And we're seeing again now, anti-Asian racism has been on the rise ever since the beginning of this pandemic, inflamed by former President Trump's racist and xenophobic rhetoric about the Chinese virus or flu and spread by his followers even as many AAPI frontline workers put their lives at risk every day to protect the public's health. But much of the anti-Asian racism don't make the headlines. Most of them actually don't even get reported. Of the 3,800 racist incidents that were reported to stop AAPI hate, nearly two thirds were verbal harassments and name calling. About one fifth were avoidance and shunning 11% were physical assaults. As I said in the email, anti-Asian racism comes in all forms. We're made fun of for, for the way we look, the way we drive, what we eat, what we wear, how we speak, how we parent. It's in the fetishization of Asian American women. 
who are often portrayed by Hollywood as exotic objects of white male sexual desires, either as the lotus blossom, submissive, sexually subservient, feminine, and meek, or as the dragon lady, deceitful, villainous, and cunning, using their sexuality as means of manipulate and gain power, a feminine embodiment of the yellow peril, which sits somewhere in the intersectionality of racism, misogyny, and xenophobia. It's, it's in the desexualization of Asian men. Now, growing up, there were no leading men uh, in, in, in Hollywood. Uh, and well, there was Fu Manchu, the sinister villain who embodied the yellow peril. And then there was Mr. Yuni Oshi in, in Breakfast at Tiffany's, played by Mickey Rooney. But, but the, the movie that still haunts me and many of my friends was 16 Candles. Remember the guy on the left, Wang Da Dong? <laughs> Man, I, 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 I wanted to be Jake so badly instead that I wanted nothing to do with being Asian American. Anti-Asian racism is all, also about being treated like a perpetual foreigner. Getting that question, where are you really from? No matter how many years, or how many generations you've been in this country. Now, I recall my first Thanksgiving dinner with my wife's extended family before we got married. My wife uh, is white, uh, and so, so it was just a miserable dinner. Uh, you know, first of all, there, there was the grandma uh, who called me a Chinaman all night long, but everyone just laughed it off because of her age and her dementia. But then there was also my wife's aunt was trying so hard to be a good host. She was trying so hard to be inclusive of me uh, during dinner conversation. But the only thing that she could think of asking me in front of everybody during dinner was about foot binding. She, she, would, she, she asked sincerely, why did Chinese men bind the feet of their women? Well, I was about 35 at the time. I've had spent uh, twice as long in this country as I had in, in Taiwan. I was naturalized uh, at age 18. I had gotten some national recognition for my work on, uh, on advancing women's reproductive rights and health equity. And yes, somehow she still thought that I would have closer connection with 19th century Qin dynasty misogyny than I have with 21st century reproductive justice in America. A perpetual corner, a guest in my own home. And by the way, calling us the, the model minority is no accolade. We seem to be going back and forth between two stereotypes. Either we're the perpetual corner or we're the model minority. Now, now I know what some of you are, are, are thinking, right? How, how can you complain about being called a model minority? Just look at yourself. You're the dean of one of the best schools of public health at one of the best universities in the world. And many Asian Americans in your audience today are some of the best doctors in America. You've all made it in America. You've all achieved the American dream. So what's so bad about that? Well, I can tell you there are at least three things that are really, really wrong uh, about the, the model minority myth. First, is that by lumping all AAPIs together, it obscures the fact that many in our communities are actually struggling. It masks the poverty rate of 29% among Burmese Americans and 22% among Hmong Americans, compared to less than 12% among all Asian Americans. And while infant mortality was 3.6 deaths per thousand life births for Asian Americans in 2018, it was 9.4 amongst Native Americans and other Pacific Islanders. And while 6% of Japanese Americans and 8% of Taiwanese Americans had no insurance, 20% of Korean Americans and 22% of Nepalese Americans had no health insurance. Without this aggregation of health and other data for AAPI groups, the needs of many of our diverse communities will remain invisible. Second is that by pitting us against other BIPOC communities, we become a convenient rationalization for white supremacy. So the argument goes something like this. Look, look at them Asian Americans. They're, they also face racism. They face all sorts of adversity, but with hard work and family values, they've been able to overcome it. 
So racism has nothing to do with the persistent struggles of black and other communities of color, ignoring that many AAPI communities also struggle because of structural racism. What this does is that it pits the API communities, in fact, uh, kind of what the BIPOC community, it weaponizes the API communities uh, as a weapon for white supremacy and has fueled anti-Black racism among Asian Americans and anti-Asian racism among African Americans that erupted in LA riot and persists today in many marginalized communities. Third, is that the model minority connotes all sorts of stereotypes about Asian Americans that reduce us to these unidimensional, overachieving, almost robot-like caricatures that play into the whole myth of the model minority. Capable of rocket science and neurosurgery and all, all the hard technical stuff, but incapable of soft skills like leadership, management, communication, negotiation, emotional intelligence. Capable of working hard and following directions and getting the job done, but incapable of full expression of our humanity, including vision and judgment and strategy and creativity and other qualities required for organizational leadership. And that's why when we get up to a certain level, we bump up against that glass ceiling, what some in our community refer to as the bamboo ceiling, pass over for leadership promotion or even training opportunities. And that may explain why Asian Americans make up 27% of professional staff at the top five companies in Silicon Valley, but only 14% of executives and 2% of Fortune 500 CEOs. 11% of law firm associates, but only 3% of partners. 10% of federal workforce, but only 4% of senior executives in federal government. And 7% of tenure faculty, but only 3% of deans, and 1.5% of college presidents. So what can we do to stop anti-Asian American racism? Well, let me suggest three things. To my AAPI colleagues and friends, we must speak up. A strategy that I and so many of my AAPI friends and colleagues have used for, for such a long time, just keep our head down and work hard to prove our worth, to earn our rightful place, that's only going to get us so far in America. We need to speak up, make our voices heard, share our stories of racism. This is our moment to name it, to confront it, to shine a light on it. Our collective pain will remain invisible until we call it out. And like me and my friends, there has always been courageous Asian Americans who have been speaking out against racism and racial injustice. People like Gordon Hirabayashi, who became a conscious objector for refusing to go to the internment camps. People like Yuri Kachiyama, who fought side by side with Malcolm X for our civil liberties and equality, including reparation for the wrongful internment of Japanese Americans in World War II. And let's not forget Yuji Ichioka at MIG, two Berkeley graduate students who came up with the term Asian American in 1968 as a direct rejection of the more pejorative terms of Asiatics and Orientals and, and founded the Asian American Political Alliance, which launched the Asian American movement in this country. If we don't want to be invisible anymore, let's make sure that our history is taught in the schools, that our contributions are recognized, that the needs, the pains of our diverse communities are not ignored and forgotten, that our voices are heard. And ultimately, if we want to move out of the guest room in our own home, we have to get politically involved. I'm glad to see that my kids now have role models in public service to look up to, that they can see themselves in people like Vice President Kamala Harris and presidential candidate Andrew Yang, Senators Amazi Hirono and Tammy Duckworth, and the 15 House members, which is more than twice than in the year 2000, Vivek Murthy, who's the Surgeon General, Shri Srivasan, uh, and the 42 AAPI federal judges who are inspiring the whole generation of AAPIs into public service. But we need more. From the White House to every state house, from the halls of Congress to every city hall, from federal courtrooms to corporate war rooms, we need to have representation if we're ever going to move out of the guest room in our own house. To my non-AAPI colleagues and friends, please speak out. I can't tell you how much it has meant to me since I wrote the email to have so many of my non-AAPI friends and colleagues reach out to me to say, 
I see you, I feel your pain, I stand in solidarity with you. But make sure you, saw, you show solidarity in action and not just in words. This is the last video that I'm gonna show you. And again, just, just a warning that this is hard to watch. What is chilling for me is not only the brutality of the attacker, but the apathy, the indifference of the bystanders. Dr. King said that the ultimate tragedy is not the oppression of the, uh, and cruelty by the bad people, but the silence over that by the good people. There's a lot that bystanders can do, starting by getting bystander training. And there's actually a good one uh, if you go to the website for Hollaback. We need to call out hatred and bigotry and racism whenever we see it, whether it's directed toward our community or, or another community, because injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And as a quote from the Holocaust Museum by, by Martin Niemöller reminds us, first, they came for the socialist, and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. And they came for the Jews and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me and there was no one left to speak for me. Lastly, let's commit ourselves to becoming more anti-racist as individuals and as institutions. At the individual level, for those of you who haven't read it, I highly recommend you read uh, Kennedy's book on how to be an anti-racist. At the institutional level, in the aftermath of George Floyd's murder, many schools are trying to become more anti-racist. I'll share some of the things that we're, be, we're, we're doing at Berkeley Public Health, but certainly we'd love to learn more about what you're all doing as well. First is a mandatory anti-racist training for all faculty, focused on skills building for anti-racist pedagogy how to engage students in difficult racial conversations. This reminds me of the time when I was at GW before I came to, to Berkeley. Uh, and one afternoon, a student came to see me. I was the associate dean at the time. Uh, and she was, uh, she was disappointed uh, with, with her faculty in the class, uh, in the classroom discussion, uh, were a woman of color uh, was sharing her uh, firsthand account of witnessing pol police brutality uh, in the neighborhood, to which uh, uh, a white student uh, in the class uh, interrupted her and basically just said, yeah, my, my, uh, my, my dad is a cop uh, and I don't think any of these things are, are racially motivated. And this was kind of followed by an awkward silence. Uh, and uh, the, 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 the professor really did not know what to do with that comment. Uh, and then, uh, so, so after a, a pause, um, she just moved on, uh, which uh, I, I think really represents a missed opportunity to engage students in the conversation about race and racism, the kind of conversation that our society is unable to have today, but, but universities ought to be better. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I knew that that professor really well. I knew her heart, it's, it's in the right place, but she just didn't have the, the right tools that the, uh, to, to, uh, uh, to, to have these kind of difficult conversations about race and racism. So, so, so it's about having conversations that, that, that allows us to, to have these kind of dif difficult racial conversations about how to assess positionality, how to address bystanderism, how to receive racial feedback which may actually be really tough for faculty at Berkeley to take because most of us like to think that we're pretty aware, pretty progressive, uh, and sometimes not even recognizing our blind spots, not even realizing that the actions that, that we have that, that have no racist intent still could have racist effects. 
So how do we develop the emotional resilience to receive racial feedback, to encourage racial feedback so that we continue to learn and grow to be anti-racist? Now, there's only so much that you can do in a three and a half hour training. So we're also launching a year long anti-racist teachers academy to provide advanced training for a smaller group of faculty on anti-racist pedagogy with the hope of building up our own internal capacity, our own cohort, black belts and brown belts who will champion anti-racism and sustain the momentum, sustain the change. The third thing that we're doing to strengthen anti-racism training throughout our curriculum, we're working on defining what are the basic anti-racist competencies that we expect every school public health students to achieve by the time they graduate. We're also piloting elective course this spring on anti-racism, making sure that the class focuses on developing, developing competencies, not only around addressing interpersonal racism, but also institutionalized racism. So how do you dismantle racist policies, practices, and institutions, which underlie so much of the health disparities in, in our country? You know, I, I spent the last 20 years uh, going around the country, working with communities like Ferguson and Flint and Baltimore uh, to, to, to try to help them address the high rates of maternal and infant mortality in, in those communities. And when I go into those uh, community meetings, it's pretty uh, um, clear to me that, that the, the driver, the root cause of the high rates of maternal and infant mortality in those communities are, uh, is, is the institutionalized racism that's, that's manifest in differential access to not just healthcare, but, but housing and jobs and opportunities, uh, the, the, the social conditions that, that are required uh, to keep everyone healthy. And yet, because most of us in healthcare and in public health aren't trained to do much about institutionalized racism, so we always go back to the easy stuff. Right? So for 20 years, I've been trying to like enhance prenatal care or to, to support care coordination. But, but I think if we are really going to make a difference if we're really going to, to advance health equity in this country, we need to be equipping the next generation of healthcare and public health change makers with the tools and skills that they need to dismantle institutionalized racism. The fourth thing that we're undertaking is a critical re-examination of people and processes from faculty recruitment to retention, to, to staff hiring and merits, to admissions and financial aid, taking a deep dive in how we're dispersing our financial aid and making sure that we're optimizing and advancing our DEI goals to, to our business practices, including purchasing and contracting to make sure that we're walking the walk and not just talking the talk. And lastly, we're, we're, we've convened a school-wide committee to, to help us develop a three-year and five-year strategic plan to becoming an anti-racist institution, to make sure that when the spotlight dims, when the national attention turns to something else, that we will sustain to our effort on becoming an anti-racist institution. And the one last thing I'll, I'll say uh, is that we must acknowledge racism as a public health crisis. It's the cause of the cause. It's the root cause of much of the health disparities that we're working to eliminate. I'm glad to see that the CDC director, the AMA, and many others have come out and declared racism as a public health crisis. Dismantling racism that remains the holy grail in our fight for health equity. I want to thank you for including dismantling anti-Asian American racism in that fight. So thank you very much. And with that, let me go ahead and turn back to Patricia. Thank you, Dr. Liu, for that insightful conversation and sharing your personal experiences with racism and I too also have some personal experiences that I've also buried and not talked about and put in a box and just kind of uh, stuck my head down and try to work as hard as possible to <laughs> to rise above and just to achieve what um, what my parents want me to achieve what I want to achieve and just to uh, to fit in if you will and succeed um, so I think when I look back and I think about why why this happens in particular to the Asian American community I think it I think it has so much to do with our culture and how we we're raised to kind of meld in and you know stick our heads down and work hard and you know respect our parents and not kind of be individuals and I think that that is very much in the culture that I grew up in and the family that I grew up in and I think 
to change that and try to have more Asian Americans feel like they should speak out, we should really reach the younger generation. Because, you know, I've tw I'm 20, like, <laughs> I've built in, like, I'm an old dog, right? I'm not going to change how I am. I might even get to try, but it's very difficult, right, to do that. And so I was wondering, like, what your thoughts on that issue are? Like, how do we reach the, you know, parents of the children or the children themselves to say, you know, it's, it's important to be, have a voice, it's important to do other things than science or be an actor or whatever, like be a po politician. Like how do we advocate that? Have you ever th have thought about those strategies? Yeah, yeah, no, I, 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 I think, yeah. First of all, okay, we, we must be the change that we want to see, right? I, I know it's really, really hard. Uh, and believe me, yeah, like uh, when, when um, and you and Nero okay, first reach out to me to, to do a grand round on anti-Asian racism, uh, uh, that 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 my first instinct was what was to decline it, you know, uh, and uh, 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 you know, if you had asked me to talk about any other kinds of racism, you know, uh, talk about racial disparities for which I've done research for the last twenty years, yeah, you know, I could have easily done it, but but this was kind of really really hard, and, and so my first instinct was to to uh, to say no, but but in a way, I, I think those of us you know, who are in leadership positions. Now, okay, do you have a moral responsibility to speak up? Now, we do have the okay, bully pulpit to 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 uh, okay, to shine a spotlight uh, on anti-Asian racism uh, to to make sure that we're doing everything we can. Uh, yeah, if not for ourselves, but at least for our children and and, and their children, uh, right? Uh, but 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 I think you're you're absolutely right, and that that's why where I'm excited to have this opportunity. Uh, to also to talk with the residents and, and talk with the medical students, to talk with the young people out there, because uh, they're teaching me a lot. Uh, they're, they're teaching me you know, a lot. Uh, just just that the, the way that we've been doing things, just keep our head down and, and you know, don't make waves, don't complain, uh, and just kind of work hard. Uh, and, and you'll get there, and, and you'll prove your worth, uh, and, and you'll earn your rightful place. Uh, you're never going to get out of the guest room in, in your own house if you keep doing that. Uh, and so I do hope that 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 you know, uh, that that the young people uh, the, uh, in in uh, okay, in this audience, um, okay, please please do speak up and please do get involved. Uh, and let's make sure that that uh, uh, you know, that that that. We that you know, that that's make sure that that you know, okay, our our voices are heard, that our history is taught in the schools, that our contributions are recognized, uh, and that our pains are not ignored. Thank you, Dr. Liu. So, do, do the panels have any questions? There's some questions in the chat. I could obviously read those questions, but do, do, do the panels have any questions? I could defer to you. If not, I, mean, I, I text a few. We, we decided that um, there's some great questions from Dr. Subak and Dr. Wynn. Do, do you want to moderate those? Sure, I will do that. So Dr. Sumac says, thanks for a heart-wrenching, horrific, and important talk. Have you found mandatory anti-racist training versus strongly encouraged to be effective? Uh, yeah, yeah, when I... Um... Uh, I, I only been a dean for for uh, about a year and a half, uh, and when I first had discussed this idea at the council of deans at Berkeley, uh, you know, some of the more senior deans kind of looked at me with a lot of skepticism and a lot of cynicism. I said, "All right, how are you going to like mandate uh, okay, your your faculty uh, to uh, to to take uh, the the, uh, the the training?" Well, it turned out that 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 yeah, I'm happy to say that. Okay, yeah, you know, uh, that that virtually all, yeah, you know, there there were a few that didn't uh, because they you know, kind of weren't around or they weren't uh, teaching. Uh, but but virtually, okay, all the the, the faculty, in, uh, all of my faculty took the you know, took took the training, and I think yeah, you know, partly it's because of the time that we're in. Yeah, you know, partly you know, the, the the moment that we're in. Yeah, you know, I, I think it was kind of Winston Christ, you know, kind of Winston Churchill, who said, you, know, you never want to waste a good crisis. Yeah, you know, I, I think yeah, you know, we're able to have the kind of conversation today that we weren't able to have even eighteen months ago. You know, uh, a lot of it is due to the. The, 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 the global and national uh, race, kind of reckoning around racial justice, 
uh, that started after okay, George Floyd. Uh, and uh, we're, we're able to like even talk about Asian American kind of racism uh, uh, that, that we haven't been able to uh, you know, previously. So, so I do think that, that you know, okay, we really need to like, seize the moment uh, and make sure that, that we use this as an opportunity uh, to, uh, to reach you know, a lot of the faculty you know, who I think um, intuitively get this, but just don't know quite what to do uh, and to kind of use this opportunity to help them become more anti-racist as well. Thank you, Dr. Wynn. I'm sorry, Dr. Liu. <laughs> as a reading story, question from Dr. Wynn, Dr. Linda Wynn. She says, thank you for a powerful talk, Dr. Liu. This was hard to listen to, but because of similar experiences. Thank you for calling out the need to be heard and speak up. Can you comment on what happened at Harvard where the anti-Asian response fell short when the website said, you may wish that you weren't Asian? What did not sit well with me was that in response to the backlash, the apology letter came from an Asian man. This felt like scapegoating. As a leading institution, how do we do better, keep each other accountable and lead by example? Right, and, and, and it is kind of that uh, kind of accountability. Uh, and, and so for kind of all of us kind of who are in kind of leadership kind of positions, uh, kind of whether you're AAPI kind of or, or kind of, you know, kind of non-AAPI, you know, we, ha we have a common cause here. You know, we, we have a common fight here you know, against kind of, uh, kind of racism and hatred and oppression and white supremacy. Uh, and, um, and, and I do think that, that uh, instead of tearing each other down, uh, instead of like pitting one community against another community, uh, it's kind of really a uh, uh, time that that we, you know, uh, I think we have a choice to make here, right? So 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 uh, uh, the question uh, kind of really is, you know, kind of what what kind of country uh, do we kind of want ours to be, uh, and what kind of country do we want our children to grow up in, uh, and. Um, yeah, I, I think many of us, uh, I, I believe okay, most of us okay, in this uh, okay, round round today feel like we're better than this. Uh, and this is a, a historical moment. This is a pivotal moment in, in the history of this nation uh, where yeah, okay, we're, we're really trying to become uh, a better version of ourselves. That's so true, Dr. Liu. Um, I think we're at the top of the hour. I could take more questions, Errol, or do you think we should... Dr. Liu, if you're still okay, can we go a couple more minutes to get a, a couple more questions, if your time's sure. better? Sure, absolutely. Thanks, so, thank you. So Dr. Valentine says, Dr. Liu, thank you for your outstanding and inspirational talk, especially highlighting um, the power of co coalition with other marginalized groups. Can you say more about how we can support and expand those interactions? Yeah, th thank you for 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 that that question. You know, I, I was uh, at a uh, at, uh, at a rally at Berkeley. Uh, I think uh, a couple weekends ago, and it was just so heartwarming uh, to see uh, uh, people of okay, all backgrounds uh, okay, at at the rally, uh, and um, so 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 I I I I do think you know, the the uh, if you're a non-AAPI, uh, to, uh, to, to, to speak up and to speak out, uh, when you see racism, when you see bigotry, when you uh, uh, you know, see xenophobia, uh, and, uh, uh, and to, to make sure that, that, you know, that, that, that you can work on uh, 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 continue to become like more anti-racist. Uh, I, I think uh, yeah, to, to take the opportunity to learn more about our history, uh, to, to, uh, uh, to, to learn about uh, what, um, uh, what, yeah, okay, what bystanders can do. I, I think yeah, there, there are a lot of things that, that okay, we all could do to support each other uh, and to really help okay, our communities and our nation become more anti-racist. That's so true. We should, we should all work together to fight against racism throughout every institution, every facet of our lives. Um, 
Wesley Park has asked about, can you address race-based admission policies? I mean, that's a touchy question, I think, in terms of admission policies based on race. Um, but maybe you could enlighten us since you're the dean of the East Berkeley School. <laughs> <laughs> it's especially difficult for, for uh, a, a dean at a public university uh, to, to address. But, but I'll, I'll, I'll talk about this. Uh, certainly, uh, like I, I do strongly say believe in, in, in affirmative action. Uh, and again, this is kind of an area where APIs are often pitted against a you know, BIPOC uh, community. Uh, and, and I'll just say this, the, the problem you know, has never been about affirmative action. The, the problem you know, for APIs has been the stereotyping of API applicants uh, in, in the admissions process. Uh, and, and so, so I'm 100% for, for, for um, you know, affirmative action, uh, uh, for, uh, but, but, but I you know, uh, can also want to make sure that, that you know, in, in the admissions process, uh, and especially kind of when we're doing holistic reviews, uh, let's make sure that, that we consider the, 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 the full humanity of our API applicants and not just kind of reduce them to these simple stereotypes that, 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 uh, that the simple caricatures uh, that they often get, get, uh, get boxed in. Yes, I always think that if, we, if, if it was based on economic lines, then you would get all the disadvantaged people, including all races, including white races that are economically disadvantaged um, for the opportunities that are difficult to get when you are poor or recently immigrated or that your parents never went to school. I think it's that to me is a very important uh, distinction between race-based admission versus economic-based admission, I think, in my mind, but I'm not dean of a public health school. <laughs> so um, I think we are at the top at uh, 9.06. I, um, I appreciate so much your time, Dr. Liu. I know this was a difficult conversation for you, um, especially since um, you, per you have not delved deeply into this arena in terms of the research side. Of course, you've had your own personal experiences as many of us have. Um, and to share that with us is, you know, is, is very special because I, it's courageous because I'm not sure that I would be able to <laughs> also share this in such a wide audience. But I, I appreciate that you went through the entire, the history of anti-Asian racism in America. I think you educated many of us um, because a lot of that, as you had mentioned, was not you know broadcasted and kind of put aside, if you will. Um, and you're right about us gathering together and being as a group against racism in general and Asians especially rising above what we were trained to be <laughs> and showing a voice, having a voice speaking up. And I'd like you to maybe give your last statements about how we can be a better, better at, uh, at being anti-racist and uh, working together as Asians to define ourselves differently, if you will, for the future. Uh, th thank you, Patricia. C certainly, uh, th thank you for inviting me to uh, okay, uh, to, to speak at, at Grand Round today. I, I think uh, that the first step uh, is precisely what we're doing today, right? To, to, to be able to bring everyone together uh, and to have an opportunity uh, to, to learn from each other. Uh, and uh, and I think you know, it's, it's the ability to have kind of these harder conversations, uh, again, that our society isn't able to have, but that, you know, that, that, that universities, uh, and especially you know, schools that are preparing uh, the, the next generation of uh, physicians and, and uh, public health uh, kind of professionals, we're going to go out and, and, and help change the world. Uh, I think you know, we need to be having conversations like this. So, so again, just thank you and thank you all uh, for this opportunity to have this conversation. Uh, thank, and thank you guys. I wanted uh, just a, a few extra thanks uh, to Drs. Dunn and Consteras on behalf of the Inclusion 2021 series. Thanks for helping organize this. 
I, I want to say a special thank you as well. In the last, especially the last month, we've had a number of faculty very vocal about the anti-Asian violence on social media and through our medium. Um, please let us know if there's anything else we can and should be doing to support each other. And thank you so much for speaking out. Uh, a special thank you to Dr. Michelle Barry, it's no longer on right now, but also helping uh, Dr. Liu, thanks for responding so quickly, but I emailed a bunch of people to try to reach out to, I didn't expect you to, to get back to me so quickly, so thank you for doing that. Dr. Nguyen, thank you for the introductions, and just there's a number of comments uh, instead of questions just saying to you, Dr. Liu, uh, basically thank you for leading by example, thank you for your presentation, and uh, and it just probably echoes many other faculty thinking the same thing. Thank you for being with us today and, and doing what you do and leading by example, as Dr. Wang mentioned. Uh, I hope everybody has a great rest of the day.